California teacher whose story was turned into a movie. I think anybody in that situation, you have to be scared out of your mind. I was told that my kids would never read a book because they were too stupid. It's actually school policy to shame the poor kid. There is no way in hell that somebody like her was ever going to make a difference in my life. The gangsters, the taggers, the chronically apathetic. Stop acting like you're trying to understand our situation. That was very evident, but they didn't want to be there. I just get so emotional when I talk about them. I am not a counselor. I am not a therapist. How am I supposed to help these kids change? 40% of high school students have failing grades. You guys, 40%. Some of the world's worst public schools. They're going to turn into criminals. A young girl walked in wearing an ankle monitor. She had a black eye, and she had a probation officer standing in the corner of my classroom. I was scared of Maria, worried that she might shoot me if I like, said the wrong thing. She was so defiant. She wrote, I hate Aaron Gruel. And if I wasn't on probation, I would probably shank her. She tried to like get to know me, and I made her pay for that. All I wanted my students to do was put down that fist, put down that rock, put down that gun. At first, it wasn't so easy. How did the first day of school turn tragic? I initially explained the rules. We're going to stand on opposite sides of the room. Here's this tape in the center. I'm going to ask questions, and you come. My students thought, this woman is crazy. Why is she asking questions that have nothing to do with education? Question after question, they giggled, they came, they did fist bumps, high fives, they rolled their eyes, and that line became that gravitational pull, that the questions became real. And then I asked a question, and I should have phrased it differently, and I just said, stay on the line if you have ever been homeless. And out darted Sue Ellen. And she went to that line like she had done on every other question about Snoop or movies or every other question. And she realized, I am all alone. And I watched her look at her feet. I think she just wanted to disappear. I think she thought in her head, hurry, ask another question. I just want to go back to the wall. I, just, I don't want to be seen. Because if they see me, they're going to know. They're going to know that I'm that girl that doesn't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. And as she stood there looking at her feet, not wanting to acknowledge anyone or anything, suddenly out of nowhere came this beautiful girl with these bouncing braids, Tiffany. And when I would asked that question originally, Tiffany told me she took a deep breath and walked backwards. And she saw Simone standing on that line all alone and she realized that is my story. Tiffany walked to that line and she looked at every single one of us. She wanted us to see her. This little girl would stand on the corner of the busiest street in Long Beach and she stood there with a cardboard box, we'll work for food. So at the age of 14, that little girl was out on that street every single day. And yet she was standing on this line in this classroom. But she was so regal. She was so courageous. It's like she owned her story. And in owning her story in that glorious moment, out came Narada, this beautiful boy. And he stood by Sue Ellen, and he stood by Tiffany, and he stood there and he owned his story. And at that moment I knew, this is gonna change that game. And then in walked this little girl. She was so defiant. She had an ankle monitor, she had a probation officer, uh, she had a father who was in a maximum security prison. And I found out that she had just been released from juvenile hall a few days before school started. There was no way in hell that somebody like her and that looked like her was ever going to make a difference in my life. So she picked up her pen and she wrote, I hate Aaron Gruel. And if I wasn't on probation, I would probably shank her. And in that moment, there was a part of me that panicked and I thought, I'm not a counselor. I am not a therapist. How am I supposed to help these kids change? And I was told by the, by the chair of my English department that my kids would never read a book from cover to cover because they were too stupid. So without really thinking it through, I just got in my car and I drove to a bookstore and I, and I ordered 150 copies of the diary of Anne Frank and I gave them the book. Well, when I gave Maria the opportunity to pick up that book, at first it wasn't so easy because she truly did not want to read it. In her mind, Anne Frank was not Latina. Anne Frank did not come from the hood. Uh, I opened this stupid book because in the back of my mind, 
I thought that I was going to prove Ms. Girl wrong. She would come back every day, and she would ask questions about Anne, kind of in juxtaposition to her gangster mentality. And I, I realized that she's actually reading. It started getting interesting when things started going bad. That's when I thought, OK, maybe she's not this spoiled little girl that I thought she was. Maybe she doesn't have a perfect little life. And that's actually when I took a liking to her. I came to the entry where she's describing this window, her only connection to the outside world. She couldn't even put her hand outside because one of the Gestapo or somebody would know that they were in hiding. And then this bird lands close to her, um, to the tree and outside the window. And she writes, um, sometimes I feel like a bird in a cage and I wish I could fly away. I was able to relate to that feeling of knowing the outside world and only having this certain connection to it. And from then on, I knew she was going to make it. She had to make it. She was going to make it because why else would we be reading this book? And she's going to make it because she's a good person and she hasn't done anything wrong. Maria came in one day, stormed in, and threw the book across the classroom and said, why didn't you tell me? And I was kind of taken aback, and I said, T tell you what? And she said, why didn't you tell me that Anne dies? At the very end, when she doesn't make it, I felt that disappointment that I felt every other time in my life when I really believed in something. It was that same feeling of going to the window and waiting, hoping that my father was going to come home, and he didn't. Uh, every feeling of disappointment all of a sudden came crashing together at that moment because I so desperately wanted her to make it. Because if she didn't make it, then what were the the chances of somebody like me, was a bad person, actually making it up. I felt horrible. I, I felt horrible because I just assumed that, that maybe she had known. That, that I, I just assumed that everyone knew that Anne Frank was this iconic figure of this tragedy. I never wanted to take away my students' hope. She did make it, Maria. She did make it because she wrote about it because Anne Frank wrote about it. She's gonna go on living even after her death. For the very first time, I felt myself changing um, in a way that I couldn't explain or I couldn't describe. Well, I wanted to give Maria and 149 others an opportunity for a second chance. And maybe they couldn't change that cast of characters they were dealt, but maybe they could rewrite their story. Maybe they could rewrite their own ending. So we decided that we were going to write to the woman who hid Anne Frank. At that time, she was 87 years old. She was living in Amsterdam. My students sat down at computers, the first time ever, and began to write and tell their story. When that 87-year-old woman, a simple secretary who had helped eight people in an attic for two years in the middle of a war, in the middle of the Holocaust, when she sat down, to read my students' stories. I think she saw something in them that she saw in Anne. Promise, potential, hope. She decided to hop on a plane, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of the side of the street they came from, regardless of what their parents did or didn't do. And she walked into our lives and she gave my students a challenge. She challenged my students to make sure that Anne's death was not in vain. And in the distance, I saw Maria, this tiny little girl who would wear this ankle monitor every day and her pants were sagging. And for the first time, she was this vision. And she said, I don't want to be pregnant by the time I turn 15 like my mama. And I don't want to spend the rest of my life behind bars like my daddy and I don't want to be six feet under by the time I turn 18 like my cousin. I want to change. And change she did. I watched 150 kids who weren't supposed to make it be the first in their families, the first to graduate from high school. 
be the first in their families to go off to college. My students went on to write a book. They'd never read a book before, and then they went on to write a book that was the number one book in America. My students were able to take their story and put it on the big screen. For a group of 150 students, change meant that they could rewrite their own ending. Change is possible. At any time, at any moment, anyone can become something bigger. Be brave, be bold, change the legacy, and change the person you will become.